So this week, I'm very pleased to introduce Dan Goldman, who's from uh, Georgia Tech. So Dan, well, you can see from the title, and he's already put his first slide up here, he works on robophysics. And I don't want to give a long introduction, so everybody already got a bio in the email announcement and so on. So with no further ado, it's all yours, Dan. All right. Well, thank you. Let me find these media controls. Um, I'm both delighted uh, to be here and uh, quote unquote here and sad that I'm not there in person, um, but maybe one day I can <clears throat> remedy that. I've never been, never been to Vancouver. Um, okay, I'm Dan Goldman. I'm in the School of Physics at Georgia Tech. Um, and I should start by saying I have no affiliation other than I advise students with engineering, uh, any of our terrific engineering programs here. But as I, as I move along, I will hope to sort of explain to you this interesting intersection we think we've discovered in the last 15 years or so, 15, 20 years, between physics and, and robotics. And so that's what we call robophysics, for lack of a better term. And I should just note, you know, I'll start with a joke in the sense that that robot, as many of you probably know, comes from the name of that comes from this play by uh, Kepek, um, Rossum's Universal Robots, um, and roboti is the Czech word I'm told for uh, meaning forced labor, uh, and I guess that could apply to some of my grad students might say on occasion, but uh, it certainly applies to this little device which we're forcing a limbless robot through a regular array of posts in this little robot will feature quite prominently in my talk today. Okay, so let's get in. Um, the discipline of robotics has largely been, uh, physicists have largely been absent from uh, this discipline. Um, it's largely involved electrical and mechanical engineering, computer science since the mid 20th century. Um, and to date, robots presently, and I think partly because of this, I have thoughts on this, presently function best in well-controlled or virtual environments. So robots uh, you know, basically weld our cars, provided the cars are placed in the right spots, the components of the cars are placed in the right spots, um, and now beat us in all, all sorts of games, uh, provided the rules of the games are relatively, uh, are relatively uh, deterministic and fixed. And robots are starting to uh, move and function, I'll say function in terms of locomotion, pretty well in what I'll call homogeneous environments. And homogeneous environments could include things like aerodynamic flight. You see robots potentially starting to deliver our packages. Uh, some robots may start to swim under the surface of water. Um, maybe not so complicated to look like a fish, but nevertheless, pretty good at autonomous propulsion within kind of homogeneous fluids. And even sort of a cockroach inspired robot, which has six legs, which and spring, six springy legs on a massive body are starting to do pretty well in homogeneous environments. And you've seen some of the fruits of these, which go back to actually military funding in the US 20, 30 years, uh, starting to emerge. If you've ever seen a Boston Dynamics video, you have seen sort of a descendant at some level from these, some of these ideas. And of course, people would love to have uh, driving cars. And I should say that the autonomy portion of the, the self-driving car in terms of steering a vehicle to move uh, in terrestrial environment um, is pretty straightforward in the sense that you have four wheels and a steering wheel and a braking gas. Of course, the vision parts are the, the real challenges in these. However, robots do not yet function well in more complicated environments. And I think I can say that pretty authoritatively. Um, here, for example, is that same robot trying to move in a sandy, rubbly slope in the Mojave Desert. Um, and you can see that the interaction with this interesting granular material can lead to failure modes, which stymie its efforts to kind of go and explore. Um, this is a famous video from NASA, uh, the Wheel of Opportunity rover on Mars many years back. And <clears throat> this, this video looks pretty impressive if you see this wheel sort of digging out of a of a, of a granular medium, except when I, you know, point out that it about took about one month for this wheel to basically extract itself, uh, the rover to extract itself out of this, and it largely sort of failed because it kind of hit a creme brulee type environment. I'm told. Uh, most relevant to the kind of stuff we'll talk about today is uh, this has been an interest in collaboration for many years with Howie Chosen at Carnegie Mellon University are robots that sort of 
basically are almost always in contact with the environment, uh, all parts of them. And this includes these limbless devices that people call sort of snake robots. And this is even called a mod snake robot. Um, and here's a robot sort of thrashing around, failing in grassy environments, things which you can imagine it, the, their sort of biological counterparts, snakes, or even nematode worms, um, function quite well in such complexity. And so this is sort of a big idea here. What are appropriate control principles, models of locomotors in complex environments? How much electronic feedback is required? How much passive mechanics? What's the role of the body morphology? And how well do we need to understand the kind of physics of interactions of limbs with, with complex materials, complex soft materials like sand and rubble? Okay, well, I'm not going to answer all these questions today, obviously, uh, but I do want to sort of point out that we have wonderful examples of systems which function quite well in uh, natural environments. And these are living systems, which is really where I kind of focus on most of my research program. And here's a video I like to show, hopefully it'll play well, uh, showing just the, the complexity and richness uh, in this sort of seemingly kind of boring physics problem of moving from A to B. Um, and so here you'll see a little lizard and behind it, you can sort of see a little snake, which is peering its head out. And just watch how this video plays. This is a little iguana, baby iguana. And this iguana is chased not by one, two, but many uh, limbless locomotors, moving both locomotors, moving over all locomotors, moving over complex terrain, rubble, sand, boulders, one using limbs and, and tail potentially to reorient, others using bodies to kind of generate thrust to move. Uh, this lizard also moves through a complex environment, sometimes including snake coils, uh, which it has to potentially extricate itself. And here it actually did. Now it runs again and does a jump and does a climb and does another jump, all while being pursued by this, uh, these snakes. Uh, and, and so I can think you can imagine that we are very far at this stage in our human technology from creating devices which have these capabilities. Okay, well, why is that? <clears throat> well, I think that there's probably some use in bringing the physics approach, the physics mindset, and some physics tools to robotics, in particular locomotion. Why? It turns out that studying sort of the emergent aspects of robot and animal locomotion has been and remains a challenge. Robots have been expensive. When I first started in this business, robots were quite costly and I had to get my engineering colleagues to build them. Hard to make flexible, no pun intended, meaning hard to kind of swap parts in and out, hard to add sensors, et cetera. Biologically, which is really, as I say, where my center of gravity sits, it, animals are often uncooperative if you try to study them in the laboratory. They're hard to control, obviously, and they're too good at what they do. If you look at this snake, slithering through the grass, and if you've ever seen a snake slithering through grass or rubble, it sort of looks like a non-problem. It is so graceful in gliding that it seems like, where's the, where's the issue here? Well, when you try to build this thing, uh, then you begin to see some of the issues. And there are limited capabilities biologically to record muscle and neural activity, kinematics and dynamics in natural environments. <clears throat> However, there's been, at least in my research program, sort of a revolution in the last 10, 15 years in the form of low cost, but smart and powerful motors, actuators, which can, which can you know, change, move things in the real world, and as well as low cost microcontrollers, think Raspberry Pi, think Arduinos, and perhaps most importantly, decreasing cost of so-called additive manufacturing, 3D printing. Uh, and these kind of have come together, at least in my group and now some others, that kind of allow us to basically create low cost, what we'll call robo-physical models to test and generate control hypotheses, compare, experiment the theory and very parameters to discover new dynamics. And this is an example I like. It's an example from uh, <clears throat> a former postdoc in my group, who's a biologist, PhD, who came and wanted to learn how to do robo-physical modeling. And within a few years, he became capable of and built this robot and studied its properties moving on granular materials. And here's a couple reviews on this, I should note, with more that I'm belatedly writing and, and always late on. Um, so that's, I think, sort of a nice story about where we are. Now, 
where does this fit into robotics? Well, you know, I think it complements robotics in the sense that my colleagues in robotics tend to focus on sort of control successes. You build a robot, it does something you want to do, and that's sort of the goal, and that's a perfectly good goal. The physics mindset, I should say, is that often I'm as interested in the failures from the demo reels that my engineering colleagues produce as the so-called successes. And so I think that this is the physics mindset can sort of bring discovery of principles of successful and failed move, movement of these self-propelling systems interacting with natural environments. Okay, that's where I think you can complement robotics. For my, as I said, and I've said <coughs> repeatedly, my main kind of area I fit in here at Georgia Tech is one which we are now calling physics living systems. Um, and the, I should note that physics living systems is sort of a term that NSF adopted, National Science Foundation adopted about 20 years ago. Um, and as sort of become for, to, to, to run a program um, and has sort of become biophysics, but a much bigger tent. So people working in my department on physics living systems work going from molecular biophysics, like my colleague Harold Kim, to population dynamics, like my colleague Joshua White, to biomechanics, like myself, uh, others. I won't list everybody, but we have a pretty nice group now working. And I should say that just as a plug, I've been on a committee that was convened by the National Academy of Sciences in the US to put out the first ever decadal survey on biological physics, physics and living systems, uh, this was headed by Bill Bialik, and it's really kind of main point is that physics living systems is now a proper uh, subdiscipline of physics. So you can use terms like living systems physicists, which I like to use, like a soft cadet, like a condensed matter physicist, natural physicist, a plasma physicist, particle physicist, et cetera. Where does the role of physics fit in? Well, I think <clears throat> this is not quantifiable yet. But I think that the robophysics complement, it's a complementary physical modeling approach to traditional physics modeling approaches. You simplify the systems to its essence and use traditionally use analytic theory, digital computation to model, be it a heart, be it a cell crawling, be it a lizard moving or a fish swimming. You now have the capability to build these kind of physical mo models to, 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 to function as models and use them in the way that we in physics use models to poke and probe and put the conference. Okay, that's the story. It turns out that kind of a, for my last 15 years, we, we've sort of taken this approach and applied it to largely to locomotion of animals uh, moving on and within granular material. And here I just wanted to give you some sample videos just to show you this is a little lizard that swims underneath sand. There's little black spots or markers that are on its body, like markers, and it uses a wave to swim. And we were able to make a robo physical model to, to capture that and, and vary parameters and explain why it used the way it did. Similarly, we had uh, some work a few years back on trying to understand this interesting form of locomotion called sidewinding. And a robo physical model helped us figure out the combinations of parameters that these snakes use to execute these interesting gates. And finally, <clears throat> also a few years back, we got interested actually in the evolution of terrestriality, how living systems moved from water to land 300 million years ago. And we used a robot physical model in addition to a, a living kind of mimic of uh, or model of uh, extinct organisms, a mudskipper fish to, to discover principles about tail use. And there's some reviews here, which you can see. Um, one thing I'll point out, which I'll come back to all the way at the end of the talk, because it actually has a nice little thing which is moving us along, uh, is that it turns out that locomotion on granular material, like sand, uh, turns out to be surprisingly easy to model using a resistive force theory approach. You can read about some of this here, and I'll return to that. Okay, but as you can sort of guess, being at Georgia Tech and having access to just incredible engineering students and physics students who want to do this kind of stuff, we've been, uh, robo-physical devices have sort of exploded in my lab. And so there's diverse little models of lunar resource, lunar prospectors, uh, sandfish lizards, bipedal walking, you name it, and the students want to build it. And I kind of benefit and then you know, turn them into physics questions. And so this is going to be today's talk. I'm not going to tell you all about all these things. I'm going to basically call, well, I've called it the fractbot here, 
So I'm basically going to be focusing on this limbless robot with wheels on its belly and tell you a little story about some of the interesting things we think we've learned. Okay. The story originates <clears throat> as sort of my example here. Is we got interested a few years back on not locomotion in homogeneous environments, like, like smooth sand or water, but locomotion in heterogeneous environments. And by the way, I should say we use this term paradynamic as an analogous, analogous term to aero and hydrodynamic interactions. And aero and hydrodynamic interactions are well described by Navier-Stokes equations. Solving that is another issue. Uh, Pterodynamic interactions, interactions of limbs or bodies with sand or rubble or boulders or leaf litter or snow are much less understood and explored. Um, and these are the folks who did the work and these are some of the papers which uh, we put out on. Okay, well, we got curious, what could we say from a sort of physics perspective about locomotion in such environments? If you're a robot and you wanna move in such environments, how smart do you need to be? How much, how much do you need to survey the landscape before you go over it, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we decided that obviously this picture is surface of Mars. That was too far away and too complex. Let's bring it to the laboratory. So here was our first, I like this because this was one of our first attempts. Here's a little very simple robot, which kind of is six-legged and cockroach inspired, and it just works in so-called open loop. It just spins its limbs. We made a laboratory version of heterogeneous terrain, which is what physicists would do, which is a bunch of gran granular material of different sizes. And when we put it in there, we immediately realized that this was also too complex. It was just too much of a mess. <clears throat> So I went back to kind of my training and said, well, you know, what do people do in physics when you have, if you can think about it, transport in, let's say, heterogeneous environments? Well, I imagine I, you know, an electron moving in a crystal uh, is moving in free space and then is encountering a scattering event and so on and so forth. What if I were to treat <clears throat> a robot moving in a heterogeneous environment like sand with a regular array of boulders in a similar sort of way. And the idea is that, well, if I could figure out the rules for scattering of a robot off a single heterogeneity, I could then, if I understood that and the, the heterogeneities were far enough apart, I could imagine getting a sort of statistical theory of transport of the robot. Started on one side of the environment, where should it go on average if I ran it a thousand times? This, of course, has a long history. Here's Lorentz, the motion of electron into metallic bodies, and has inspired a lot of applied mathem mathematics, including uh, billiards type problems, uh, as well as has some, some background in, in chaotic dynamics. Okay, well, we decided to start simple, and this is Fei Fei, who's now an assistant professor at the University of Southern California, and she made a system which we call Scatter, Systematic Creation of Arbitrary Terrain and Testing of Exploratory Robots. And it's basically a robot that controls a robot. We see here is a little robot, that same little robot I showed in a few slides before, with six legs. And here's a boulder. And this is a gripper called a universal jamming gripper, which picks up anything, essentially. And it picks up the robot. It moves it out of the way. There's a so-called fluidized bed, which turns air on to a container, to this container of granular material and resets the granular state, puts the robot down, puts the boulder in its place. That way we can do repeated systematic tests over and over and over. It's kind of like a computer simulation of uh, one would do for numerical uh, work in which I could just vary parameters and try it over and over and over. This is sort of in the real world. Okay, well, what do we define? <clears throat> I found something kind of interesting that when the robot was moving, and here's just one trial, here's the boulder, shining bright. Uh, sometimes the robot would collide with it and bounce off up into the right here. But often we would find the robot sort of would collide and look like it was, if you were blurred your eyes, attracted to the area behind the boulder. That seems sort of interesting. Obviously, this has to do with a kind of imbalance of torques that the limbs who are moving in sand and moving on the boulder undergo. But uh, from that perspective, it looked like it was a sort of attractive scattering interaction. And so then we varied parameters. We varied the impact parameter, how far away the robot is laterally and, and, and back and forth. Uh, and we found indeed, sometimes the robots scattered off boulders, which 
was what we sort of expected, but very often it was attractive T to the boulder. And so that seems sort of interesting and cute. Um, I should note that typically in robotics, the paradigm has been, if there are heterogeneities, avoid those heterogeneities. Okay. We decided to put other objects into the arena. And so here's the sphere and measure their scattering patterns. Here's a half cylinder. The half cylinder kind of looks like a sphere in the sense that you get some trajectories which are scattered. I'm only showing one half of the plane here, scattered down to the left. Uh, other scattered, other trajectories where the robot seems to be attracted in behind the half cylinder. And then amusingly, if you made it a whole cylinder, you got sort of a hole in the distribution, the scattering distribution right uh, after the, after the post-collision. There are forbidden regions where the robot would go. I should say also in all of this, the robot is not undergoing any closed feedback in these cases. This is what we call open loop. It's simply playing its motor program in this case with its nose. Okay, well, this seems sort of interesting. And when I started talking about this with colleagues, people say, well, I you know, can do scattering physics. We learned that in classical mechanics. And I happened to be teaching classical mechanics undergrad when we started looking at this, and I was looking at Landau and Lifshitz, and I come across, I've been teaching this, collisions between particles. In many cases, the laws of conservation of momentum and energy alone can be used to obtain important results concerning the properties of various mechanical processes. It should be noted that these properties are independent of a particular type of interaction between the particles involved. And it hit me that, well, our systems are non-equilibrium damp-driven systems, in the sense that the robot has some battery, which is supplying energy, which is allowing it to motivate its limbs <clears throat> and energy is thus not conserved nor is momentum conserved in these ultimately it's conserved but not in the laboratory and so what we're studying is sort of a different kind of collisions and active matter wasn't a thing when we started working on this kind of stuff it wasn't much of a thing and so we call them active collisions okay well oops oops sorry about that uh, Okay. And then we start looking around and find that active collisions, which is sort of persistent dynamics leading to novel mechanics are everywhere. <clears throat> so whether you be studying chlamydomonas, uh, a little algae swimming in the micro scale or cockroaches or cockroach inspired robots kind of forcing their way through grass or even this interesting system with a little millimeter droplet of fluid being oscillated by a pan of fluid and kind of interacting with its wave field to move it forward, putting active systems uh, in the presence of heterogeneities leads to interesting and novel mechanics and dynamics. Okay, we decided then, because we were interested in limbless locomotors, to look at this active collisions in a limbless system. And so here's our robot, or our robot physical model. It's relatively simple. It's got 16, 12, 3D printed uh, joints with motors connecting each of these serially. We can control these motors to oscillate back and forth and they then connect a segment which connects to the next segment, which connects to this next segment. So you can imagine that if I control the motor's angle as a function of time to be sinusoidal and I phase things right, I can get a sinusoidal traveling wave of body angle in the body. If we just leave that robot dangling in the air, hold it up by a string, it'll just wiggle back and forth and not go anywhere to couple it to an environment, we use Lego wheels. These are passive wheels. You might think that's rather artificial. It turns out that the kind of reaction forces we've discovered for wheels on hard ground are not unlike bodies moving in sand. That's a separate story I could tell you. Okay, that's the idea and that's the rules of the game. The other rules of the game is that this is a purely open loop system. It's control scheme, and this is what the motors are good at, is maintaining this formula as a function of time, even in the presence of environmental obstacles. Okay, here's the experiment. Right again, it's relatively straightforward. We have a bunch of cameras which track these IR reflected markers on the body. We're gonna put a kind of model heterogeneity in front of the robot, which are a bunch of force sensors and those force, uh, sorry, a bunch of posts. And we are able to vary the space in between those posts. Okay. Again, the control scheme is do not let the robot sense the surroundings. Only control is maintaining the self-deprivation pattern. And what do we find? Well, we start the robot at various initial conditions relative to the, to the, to the posts. And some, it's 
in the right of this box. Others you'll see it shift to the left of this box. Some you can bring it forward in this box, other than back. I should say that because of the periodicity here, you only have to sample this box and then you have all the initial conditions. It's quite repeatable. If I start the robot in the same initial condition, it will go approximately to the same spot. What does that mean going to the same spot? Well, you'll note here that sometimes for some initial conditions, the robot scatters off to the right. Some initial conditions, it kind of goes straight. Other initial conditions, it really scatters off to the right. And others, it goes off. Oh, hang on, let me fast forward a little bit. Some often to the left. You can track these, tracking these markers with cameras. And you see that there's a pretty repeatable pattern that if I start the robot's head in this part of the box, the red means it scattered positively. And in this part of the box, it will scatter off to the left. Okay. Because we were having fun, and this was sort of a thing which kind of was looking wavy, I said, well, let's call this mechanical diffraction. Now, Obviously, this is not real diffraction by waves. Everybody knows that we learned in Physics 101 that diffraction of real waves by regular rays results in an interesting interference pattern such that I have maxima, which occur at D sine theta equals M uh, lambda. Where lambda is the wavelength, and D is the spacing of the array. Okay, well, we got curious as to if we did the experiment enough times, what the scattering patterns would look like. Um, but before we did that, I, I was sort of reminded of a, of, a, of a term that Eddington used because we obviously don't have a wave of snake. We have something which kind of is wiggly like a wave and localized like a particle. And Eddington called these in the early days of quantum mechanics, wavicles. And it turns out that G.I. Taylor, later famous for fluid dynamics, was the first person to measure uh, wavicle uh, interaction, wavicle diffraction, and did a beautiful experiment where over three months basically exposed uh, plates to, to very feeble light and found at the end of the day a beautiful diffraction pattern, even though the, he discovered that the, the, this was indicated that, that the system was only one unit, indivisible unit, was coming through at a time. Here's, of course, a more modern version, in which I can take an electron, which is Eddington's term, a wavicle, which has both wave and particle properties. And uh, if I do these experiments enough, out comes a beautiful uh, diffraction pattern. And the famous experiments, at least in the mechanics world, in the last 15, 20 years, uh, in Coudere and then Lefort and John Bush and others, have now shown fascinating sort of diffraction-like phenomena, wavicle-like phenomena, where going back to the same video that I showed before, here's a little particle entrained with its wave field, and the combination of these two does makes rather beautiful dynamics, non-quantum dynamics. So again, we decided we would sort of see if we could build up a diffraction, what kind of diffraction pattern we could build up. And here is Perrin, who was a PhD student and now a postdoc at Harvard, taking this robot. At the time, we didn't have a scatter-like system, so we had to resort to Perrin, putting the robot in its box full of initial conditions and doing the experiment hundreds and hundreds of times. <clears throat> and what I'll show you now is the result of this uh, set of experiments. And what you're going to see is on the left, you'll visualize the, the trajectory of the head of the robot. Now on the right is sort of the average midline, which will be straighter. And I'm just gonna sort of add up all the experiments she did um, and did a lot of experiments. And this is what you sort of see. As you start adding more, exper more and more experiments, a pattern emerges and the pattern looks like the snake's head either goes straight through the lattice or off to the left or off to the right. And the midline, you can see a similar story. If I measure, if I show you all 307, 27 trajectories plotted, and I measure the scattering angle, what you find is that the snake either scatters straight through the lattice or again, off to the left or off to the right. And that's the probability distribution. Now, to vary parameters more widely, we, oh, and here's a fun quote, which I like. Both matter and radiation possess a remarkable duality of characters. They sometimes exhibit the properties of waves at other times those of particles. Now it is obvious that a thing cannot be the form of wave motion composed of particles at the same time. The two concepts are too different. Well, Heisenberg didn't know about robots at the time. Okay. 
We decided to, so we could vary parameters more widely. We would do numerical simulation and we hooked up with Dan DeGroote and a former student of his. And these are pretty sophisticated multi-body collisional simulations using this chrono engine. And when we measured the drag anisotropy of wheels and did a whole lot of stuff, which I'm happy to talk about, we were able to show that over a wide range of parameters, once fixed, the experiments, and here we're varying different post uh, distances between the posts, uh, were in good accord with the uh, numerical simulation. So we have a tool which we could more readily vary things. Okay, and here's one set of parameters we varied, which was kind of interesting. We said, well, let, what happens to these scattering patterns as I vary the spacing between the, the, the lattice elements? And what happens is the following. As I open up the spacing between the lattice elements, you see that this diffraction pattern becomes basically single peaked. And that makes sense because for sufficiently widely spaced posts, the thing is basically just gonna go through unimpeded. As I squeeze down the spacing as D decreases, what you see is that the power spreads out in the diffraction pattern and becomes more strongly peaked. You can measure the basic spread of the diffraction pattern plotted here is the 15th quantile angle, which is a robust measure of the spread of the distribution and plot that as a function of D. And you see indeed what I just narrated that in the experiment and the simulation are in pretty good accord up to the smallest spacings, which, which we think is where the robot couldn't execute its, its gate pattern, its wave. Um, and they sort of track this interesting line, which I'll just for amusement plop down it turns out with a one parameter fit, this is basically the same sine theta uh, Fraunhofer diffraction formula that I showed you from before. Now, there's obviously nothing quantum mechanical going on here, but there is some interesting active mechanics here. And I'll just give you one slide, which gives you the flavor. If you look at this video, you see that the robot, because of its persistence of motion, because of the motors are always trying to create this shape, when its head collides, and its head, in this case, hits straight on, it can't go anywhere until the head achieves a tangency condition where it can sort of just slip off. And when it does that, that actually, as it's grinding its head against the post, leads to a reorientation of the body because the body is tightly controlled to maintain that shape and the wheels slip on the ground. So and it turns out that the longer the head spends grinding on the post, the more the snake, the robot will scatter to the left or to the right. And it turns out also you can imagine that if you just graze the post, you won't scatter, you won't grind your head very long, and you won't scatter very much. And if you hit it, you know, at certain spots on the post, you'll spend a longer time. And then as spacing decreases between multiple posts, you find trajectories that just grazed uh, now have a probability to encounter a post which would lead to a larger scatter. So the other pegs sort of quote unquote interfere with low duration grazing trajectories that would have occurred. And that explains certain aspects, but the key ingredient is this kind of persistence of dynamics that is very different in an active system than a typical system, passive system, classical system we study in intro physics. Okay, uh, well, you can read more about the details, but just for amusement, we said, because also this happened in the real world, suppose the heterogeneity can move a little bit in response to the collision. So we did this, we tested the importance of the active collision, and we did it in sort of a fun way, inspired by the old Bohr-Einstein debates. What if you, what if the array could move in response to the, to the collision? So here we have a very heavy array, which can flexibly, which can frictionlessly slide along the plane. And over here, we have a very lightweight array relative to the snake, which can slide and be pushed out of the way. And in between, we have a kind of medium weight array. And you'll be amused to see that the more the snake moves the array, oops, the less you get a nice peak diffraction pattern and things sort of narrow. So if you were playing the game where you could only observe which, where the, the robot, which spot it went through uh, by the action of the array, you would find that you would have destroyed the diffraction pattern by such shenanigans. Okay, well, I should say that this robophysics making analogies has been kind of fun uh, and has led to other systems. And since this is a physics and astronomy, I had to 
put this in uh, these papers in review, but this is a collaboration I've been undertaking with my colleague, Pablo, the former colleague, Pablo Laguna, in which I was jealous of the uh, relativist folks who got to study these interesting interactions where matter uh, curves space time and, 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 uh, and, and space time tells matter how to move and the matter tells space time how to curve. So we decided to do the old educational demo of putting a marble on a spandex sheet, except in this case, we made the marble active. So a little robot. And it's kind of cool that you can deform the, this is Yasmin, the postdoc who did it, deform the sheet just with your finger. And you can then basically use the force to, to let the robot follow around. Uh, it turns out that, that if you put a robot on this membrane with a fixed central depression, it generically orbits. And many of those orbits are, I don't know why this is not playing, are not circular, but in fact process. And they process in a way that uh, is kind of interesting. And I should say that, that we have now mapped this thing to the robot plus the membrane as a test particle undergoing geodesic dynamics in a sort of fiducial space time. So we've been able to kind of make a laboratory GR, uh, analog GR system for what it's worth. And this isn't playing, but if it were, you'd see we're now exploring multiple vehicle interactions where one robot drives and influences the curvature of the spandex which influences the dynamics of the other, which influences the dynamics of both. And so we're playing those games. Okay, how much time do I have? 10 minutes or so? Uh, 10 minutes, fine, yeah. Very good. All right, so we decided, and this is where it kind of gets more uh, serious, I guess. We decided to see how robust this collisional diffraction effect is and see if it could be applied to living systems. And I, for sake of time, I won't give you the whole story other than to say that this is a little snake which is sort of a robotic snake. It basically play, it lives in the desert Southwest of the US and it plays this wave that goes from head to tail. Oops. It goes from head to tail down its body. And this we've discovered is evolved to allow it to slither across sand quite effectively. This animal also does cool things. It buries into sand in the blink of an eye. And here you can see it. And we studied some years back that the kind of mechanics using x-rays by which it moves. Um, and it's interesting thing about it is it lives in an environment which is sort of physicist friendly in the sense that it's a lot of homogeneous sand coupled to heterogeneities, little sparse plants and brush, which are relatively far apart. And this is a track we took, we, we saw the night after, uh, or, or after, a, after a night where these animals forage. And here you can see outline the track where the snake runs into a plant and then scatters and goes on its way. So we decided to see if we could look for this effect in real snakes, this, this kind of wavical diffraction effect. And there we, we did the experiment, which were much harder. You have the snakes, we cover their eyes so they can't see what's coming. They don't have great vision anyway. You have, again, a regular array of posts. You start the snake on one side and you give it a tap and it scoots through this array. And that's the experiment we used in this case, not granular material, but shag carpet, because it turns out it's a good mimic, a kind of yielding mimic of granular material, and we don't have to reset the sand each time. So here's this story. As you can see, there's one experiment, and there's another experiment, and you can sort of see it played at half speed. The snake kind of makes it through. It moves pretty fast. Oops. But that's the experiment. Now, I should say, and I'll, I'll skip this just for a second time, that these posts were force sensitive, so we were able to measure its interaction, which turns out to be an important story later. The bottom line is that this snake, when it's scooting through this array, is playing, we think, a very simple motor pattern, which our some theory tells us is good for movement in these kind of environments. Okay. Okay, let me just skip that. So we also discovered that the dynamics were relatively unaffected by the post. So you could see that the speed of the snake, the distribution of speeds pre, after, and within the post, as well as a so-called heat map of the curvature of the wave curvature of its body were relatively unaffected. All right, so what changes? Well, if you do this experiment over and over and over, 
you see that sometimes the snake scatters to the left, sometimes the snake scatters to the right. And again, we think that the snake is moving fast enough that it's not seeing what's happening. And again, we've covered it's not, and it's not able to react to what's happening. We'll get to that in a minute. And this is the sort of scattering pattern of the snake. And it turns out that if you start to bin this thing, if you look in a little annulus here at where after 182 trials, the snake went, well, before it scatters, the snake has an evenly distributed, uh, even distribution of positions. After you sort of see a, just a spread of, of, of power in the trajectories, and by the time you get to the far field, you've basically created five peaks in which the snake has essentially scattered into. Okay, well, now, why was this interesting? Well, because it told us something about the kind of control, the so-called neuromechanical control scheme of the snake. And you can see in these videos that as the snake is colliding with obstacles, it's basically crumpling upon collision. And that crumpling upon collision uh, is, we think, an important feature of the dynamics. And to make a long story short, what we've done is by studying the collision of the snake in a kind of analogy to scattering and particle physics, it allows us to peer into the snake's control scheme. And it turns out that a key ingredient of the control scheme of a snake in any limbless locomotor is the fact that unlike our robots in which we serially connect motors, which, which, which bend each, the one bends the next, bends the other, snakes actuate by having a flexible spinal cord with muscle on either side of the body. And it turns out biologists about 30 years ago developed a hypothesis that, or did, made measurements uh, of this bending pattern. And the interesting bit of the biology here is that when a snake activate its muscles on either side of its spinal cord, this region of black is muscles active and the muscles contracting, this is off. Next to it, down the body, this is off, this is on. And this pattern will propagate down the body. We always have on the other side of the body, uh, unactivated muscle. Why is that important? It turns out that what that allows you to do, this was Perrin's insight, is to make a model that says where muscle goes from on to off, the snake is gonna have preferred buckling points. And when you put that into a model, you find that you get a diffraction pattern and that that diffraction pattern with essentially no fit parameters uh, recovers for at least the first three peaks of this diffraction pattern. Now, I'm telling you this because what this led to is sort of amusing practical, uh, in, uh, practical uh, and we think interesting new robo-physical model of limbless locomotives. And this is work that was done by an undergrad, a fantastic engineering undergrad at Georgia Tech, in which we made, we think, a new kind of limbless robot, which basically has a flexible spinal cord and cables on either side of its flexible spinal cord. And by winding cables on one side of the body and unwinding them on another, it leads to this sort of directional, passive directional compliance in the body. And it turns out that not only can you make the robot then move reasonably well on hard ground, something rather to my mind, extraordinary happens when you put it in, let me just skip to this because I'm running short on time. When you put it in a lattice environment and turn it on and just let it play its motor program of winding and unwinding its, its motor spools, it manages to explore and locomote through this heterogeneous environment with essentially no electronic feedback and no, we'll say brain power. Now, in contrast, all other robots, limbless robots at this time have been created are, are essentially serially connected actuators. And so this one little trick allows you to go from complex control schemes, which we worked on with one of these serially connected robots years back, uh, which require thousands of lines of code and lots of electronic feedback to navigate a lattice to something which basically has zero brain power. And so we think that this can help simplify control tasks in robots. Okay, I think we've since improved on the robot, but since I'm running a bit long, 
and I want to leave time for some questions. I'll just get to the end and say that this is these robo physical models are then going to, we think, help us ferret out control schemes in these living systems, including uh, snakes and including nematode worms. But if you want more robo physics, you can join us in Chicago next week. Uh, for the APS March meeting, where we'll be running a RoboPhysics focus session, which is in year seven, with my co-organizer, Professor Chen Li. Uh, and I think that's all I want to say, other than we have this robotics meets physics, or a systematic study of self-propelling systems. And now we can build these things readily and use them as scientific instruments to learn new active physics as well as function as models of living systems. In the example today, in an effort to discover principles of limitless locomotion and complex brain, we found analogy to wave particle duality in robots revealed novel teradynamic active collisional interactions, which can be used as heuristics for certain kinds of control, and led to the development of a new kind of limitless robot which simplifies control in obstacle-rich environments via passive mechanisms. And in the remaining one minute, this is why I'm rushing a little bit, I just want to tell you something which is kind of amusing, and amusing in the sense that I never thought I would be in this position and amusing in the sense that it, or perhaps interesting to the engineering physics folks here, in the sense that we've now been using some of this stuff to actually make practical robots. And it turns out, if you'll indulge me for two minutes, it turns out that all of the examples I've shown you today, be it robots with wheels on hard ground, be it robots swimming in sand, be it robots moving on frictional ground, to your eye, you might say, well, this thing sort of looks like an eel swimming. Um, and here, the answer is no. It turns out that in these situations, these organisms propel via when inertial forces, you can basically flick your tail and move. This is how you and I swim in pools. Uh, inertia is greater than or comparable fluid resistance forces. In these cases, inertia is much less than any frictional forces. If this lizard stops self-deforming, stops wiggling its body, or this robot stops wiggling its body, it basically stops on a dime. It turns out that the world we've been exploring in the last 15 years has much more in common with that of the micro world, as beautifully narrated by Purcell in his, his talk and paper, Life in the Reynolds Number. That's the world of nematode locomotion and fluids. That's the worm of spermatozoa. And why am I telling you this? Because this has now led to, for me, just an a, a incredible kind of discovery of work that was basically started by Wilczek and Shapir in the 80s, uh, which, which they realized that sort of a, there's a geometric phase uh, lurking in locomotion, which I will not, that's a separate talk or two, and was really embraced, not by physicists, but by control theorists in the 80s, 90s, and then the 2000s, and essentially works by sort of developing a scheme in which one draws paths in a configuration space. In this case, it's a configuration space defined by two angles of this little primitive so-called three-link Purcell swimmer. And by integrating, doing a surface integral over a certain space, one can deduce good paths in the space, meaning good ways to control the body uh, or limbs of a robot to, to affect the motion. The greater the integral, the more you go per cycle. Now, we've applied this to not only robots from a few years back, but now to an enormous diversity of organisms, including legged organisms, including many legged organisms. And the cool surprise has been that not only can we kind of study these many legged systems now and make robo physical models by adding kind of passive components, which we've observed in the animals, in this case, kind of limbs, which passively fold and glide uh, along as the robot moves in the form of sort of a crude mechanism, crude effective mechanism here, it turns out that an engineer I had, who's now a faculty member of Yasmin, I was kind of Iden at Notre Dame, brought these from the robophysics, where it sits in the lab and we just treat them as models, to actually bring them outside. And lo and behold, when you bring these things outside and you have this kind of biomechanics insight, and this what we call geometric mechanics, this geometric phase approach and soft robotics in our laboratory experiment, you get a device which becomes 
quite capable, emergently capable of transport in very complex pterodynamic, heterogeneous pterodynamic environments. So the whole story I told you turns out to have not only interesting ending for the biology, but in fact, I and a colleague have just started a company to try to commercialize some of these devices, which we're calling ground control robotics, just incorporated, which we think we will be able to use swarms of these types of devices to go seek out herbicide resistant uh, weeds in crop fields. And that's all I'll say for today. That's the end. And I'm happy to take any questions and apologize if I went a little bit over. Oh, that was good timing. So thanks again, Dan. That was great.